Hello and happy Sunday. And um, Trixie says hi. And uh, both of my cats are in here right now. So there may be a few uh, playful growls as they enjoy stalking each other. And um, so I apologize for that in advance. Um, what I'm showing you here is the Atlas Edition Legendary Trains binder and my card collection. So this came out in the late 90s. It was a mail order subscription where you could get um, these uh, cards for all of these classic trains and beautiful, it's basically like a beautiful photograph with information that you could also get other details to put into the binder. Um, so it's a nice little collection for people who like trains. Um, one of my favorite movies is The Station Agent. I don't know if you've seen that one with Peter Dinklage. Um, it's uh, it's got uh, it's about this um, man who very very uh, introverted man who uh, inherits a train station and li wants to live there by himself, but other people um, you know refuse to let him be alone. Until he finally, they kind of break his ice and become friends with him. It's really a great movie. But uh, he's definitely, he loves watching trains. I mean, that's his hobby. And many people have that hobby of watching trains. So, anyway, this is the binder. And it's kind of a dramatic picture here. And it's the dark. You see the train light. I really do like this picture. And you see all of the, all of the smoke and steam and everything. I really like that. The back of it. And it starts out with um, selected NORAC operating rules. So uh, it's giving you a little bit of extra information in the binder here. And it's uh, terminology and definitions like um, automatic train stop or ATS, a device on an engine that will cause a penalty application of the brakes if the engineer fails to acknowledge a cab signal change to a more restrictive indication. If you ever want to join a train club where they watch, you know, movies that they film with their phones of trains and stuff, you're going to need to know all of these terms because they're going to be saying them like block signal, blocking device, blue signal, a clearly distinguishable blue flag, blue light or blue tag by day or a blue light or blue tag by night. When displayed, it signifies that workers are on, under or between equipment. And, you know, driving a train, there's a lot of things to think about. There's a lot of safety things to think about because a train cannot stop very fast. It takes almost a mile for a train to fully stop. It's, it's I mean, when you think about that, if you, by the time you see a train coming down on you, if you're not off the tracks, it won't be able to stop by the time you see it. And another thing about trains to remember is... They move really, really fast, but your eyes betray you. It doesn't, the, the, the motion of the train as it comes towards you, it, you do not read it as fast as it actually is. That's one of the reasons many people have been hit by trains. So, a little train safety there. Um, we have some miscellaneous signals. And, I mean, this is basically to get you familiar with railroading and all of now I think there was a train whistle on here and it is long gone but I can probably find a replacement and um, see this comes with a manual then we have a user manual and it opens like so and it shows you how to fill and display your cards in your album. Now, these would come in the mail. And um, many, many people have this collection. So, if you're what, you might have this. It's your glossary. It shows you all of your terms. So, when you get to the cards, you can understand them. Now, the basic technical data. These data pages examine the fundamental elements of a railroad, different types of locomotives, steam, electric, and diesel, 
the way these locomotives operate and, and how their mechanical parts are arranged form the core of this category. Also covered in detail are the essentials of the railroad, such as steam locomotive classification system, safety devices, signaling, couplers, braking systems, switches, track, traffic networks, stations, tunnels, and bridges. And it's a nice, beautiful, shiny paper. And then we get right down to business with the Flying Scotsman and a really, really nicely done illustration of the train here from so although the flying scotsman locomotive did not get its name until 1923 a train by that name has been running since 1862 linking london and edinburgh by the east coast the flying scotsman train which left london's king's cross station daily at 10 a.m kept to the most famous schedule in the world and of course it was kept to the minute and it gives you a history starting in the 20s um the era of the 1920s and 30s was without a doubt the heyday of the flying scotsman it departed king's cross at 10 a.m and i've been to king's cross station and crossed the stretch of 393 miles to edinburgh in five hours and 45 minutes at an average speed of more than 68 miles per hour which was exceptional for that time. Composed of 24 coaches, this immense train had, among other amenities, a dining car decorated in French style, evoking the stylish era of Louis XIV, a salon car with a hairdresser, and private compartments for ladies traveling alone, and a radio receiving station, which printed bulletins on stock market rates and even published bulletins with photographic negatives, received by a photo telegraphic receivers to show the finishes of horse races i mean this is like the titanic of trains um and then you get a factoid blank here it's in in beige and um which gives you a little bit more detail and um then it describes the trip you have a photograph um it sa says above seen from the rear the tender diaphragm and buffers can be observed. These features were useful in providing stability for the first cars and allowed the crew access through the tender to the train. So that's kind of, and your card also has um, grand era of international luxury trains. And if we go back to how to use the book, we will note the different categories of cards and this is category nine and you know one is basic technical data creation of the world's first railway systems golden age of the british system golden age of the italian french german big alpine european and so forth so so we looked at our first card and you also have a date and a flag to indicate um, what nationality this train was. Okay, so the next one is the SNCF class Y5100. This is French from 1960. It's from the golden age of the French system. Built by D. Dietrich between 1968 and 1962, the Y5100 series of 62 small switchers is, in terms of size, one of the smallest on the French National Railways roster. A featherweight class of only 22 ton units with a maximum speed of 11 miles per hour, these units were designed for low speed switching and industrial service on light curves small but efficient and then you have your factoid box here your technical characteristics and let's move to the next one the collet tank locomotive and look at that beauty this is british 1929 from the golden age of the british system the great western railway which served the west of england and wales was a railway with a difference it was, technically speaking, extremely original. 
the railway was merged into British Railways into the nat nationalization of 1948. One of the chief mechanical engineers who left his mark on this railroad was Charles Collett. He was noted particularly for his very successful tank no locomotives. And, I mean, can you imagine seeing something like that moving today? And here's a Polish TKI-3. And it's 1908 from Poland, other European systems, category 8. The Polish TKI-3, an example of the excellent professional work that enthusiasts and model railroad associations can accomplish, is demonstrated by the 260T locomotive that was refurbished by the Poznan Club of Poland. Recovered from a sugar extraction plant and extensively rebuilt, the locomotive was completed in 1995 in time for the 150th anniversary of Polish Railways. Let's take a look at that again. Next is a steam locomotive classification. This is basic technical data card. So this is just information. Since the beginning of the railroad, locomotives have been classified to identify them clearly. Classification by number and placement of axles rapidly became the standard. It permitted identifying the type of locomotive directly from the wheels, counted from front to back, the number of leading idlers, small wheels, the number of driving axles, large wheels, the number of rear idlers, small wheels. The Americans and British count wheels, the French count axles, and other countries use mixed systems with letters for the driving axles. So the placement of axles is right here, see? And then the American British classification, the French classification, the German, and then the names. You might recognize some of these names like Reading Railroad and stuff if you play Monopoly. <laughs> Creation of the of the world's first railway system. The fascinating story of how the railroad started is recounted through descriptions of early trains and railway lines, which were created by pioneers and visionaries who sought to bring areas and nations closer together with railroad tracks. Since the very beginnings of the railroad from early 1904, I'm sorry, 1804 to the birth of the first great European systems in 1840, the railroad has stood as the world's first great technical creation and the forerunner of a new era. Look at that old engine. Now let's read a little bit about it. This is the Stevenson rocket. Um, Stevenson's rocket from Great Britain, 1829. Um, this machine is often considered the first locomotive in history. It was the first modern locomotive to meet the definition and it easily won the famous rain heel trials operating at 29 miles per hour with a full load. That's pretty crazy, isn't it? This is the planet. And look at how small it is because look at the engineer. This is from 1830. The planet was was the first mass-produced locomotive and it provided the first commercial passenger service on the first railway line open to the general public. It was this Stevenson designed locomotive that convinced skeptics of the usefulness of steam rail transportation. And if you look behind it, you'll see a car where people can sit. So it's the first passenger train. And we get to the golden age of the British system. The 19th century was undoubtedly the century of British domination of the world, thanks to Great Britain's Industrial Revolution, which began far ahead of those in other countries. The 19th century British Railroad was the most accomplished and the best developed, with its beautiful locomotives displaying a Victorian elegance, its luxurious cars, and the Gothic splendor of its stations. Steam traction came to a peak during the 1930s, and British streamlined trains of that era were superb. However, World War II, with its introduction of nondescript diesel and electric trains and the rise of automobile transportation, transformed the railroad. It would never again recapture its former glory. This is um, Glassline United Dairy's milk tank, a milk tank car. Milk tank cars, 1930 Great Britain. Many Britons and many Americans, too, fondly remember when little trucks delivered fresh milk daily to the steps and porches of their houses. 
In those days, the milk traveled by train before it reached consumers in their homes. Sadly, all that is a thing of the past. Now, I'll share a story. When my dad was going to college at Texas A&M University, um, and we lived in College Station way, way, way back in the late 70s, early 80s, they had a, a dairy school. And you could still get dairy milk delivered in the old timey bottles. So I actually am one of the few people who can remember the getting milk bottles. Um, and the interesting thing about milk bottles versus the milk you can get in the store, in the grocery store, is they had cream in them. So, um, it, it, the glass bottles of milk had cream on top and it was it it was sort of separated but unlike nowadays when you buy milk you buy milk and you buy cream separately but when you got it in the glass bottles you had cream and you had milk in the same bottle so that's a little memory of mine but I was really young but I do remember the bottles and the little caps um this is a mallard Um, 1935 Great Britain. This beautiful locomotive in the A4 series represents the peak of British steam and British rail fans consider it the best in the world. The Mallard certainly was the fastest steam locomotive in the world with a sustained speed of 125 miles per hour. On July 4th, 1938, the masterpiece of mechanical engineer Sir Nigel Gresley, the A4s replaced at the head of the great fast trains from London to Newcastle and from London to Edinburgh. Look at that. It looks like a bullet. It's just amazing. This is the Southern Pacific Railway's bullied 462 Pacific. Um, the, the bullied 462 Pacific locomotives owe their unusual streamlined design to the English engineer Oliver bullied who championed cost savings through highly original designs this series of remarkable locomotives was the largest in number of the british pacifics if not of the best this is 1941 and then let's get to the golden age of the italian system and you might be familiar with the quote from benito mussolini that said if i'm um the leader of italy i will make sure all the trains run on time and they did so um the Italian railroad is noted for its engineers' great capacity for innovation. It is one of the most original railroads in existence, particularly in view of its forward-looking electrification and massively built rights-of-way. The Italian railroad also invented the high-speed line, the famous directi directitissimo, built especially to overcome the geographic obstacles to rapid movement, and was one of the forerunners of using tilting high-speed trains. As for Italian stations, their style expresses a most unusual aesthetic refinement. And I am proud to say that I have ridden on Italian trains. I wish I had some cards for this category. Um, I have ridden on them, the regional. And uh, there's two types of trains. Like when you go to Italy, if you want to take a train, you can take a regional train or like a city to city train. The regional trains are cheaper, but um, they... Uh, will take longer like me and Mary were in Florence and we wanted to get back to Rome so we took a regional train and it was a really cheap for a first class compartment so we had a first class compartment all to ourselves, but we were on the train all night long going through all these different stops versus if we just done a city to city and paid a little more we would have gotten there much quicker now we this is the category for French system so I got some French cards um, this is the Paris Orlen Railway 2D2, and look how pretty that is. Um, 1926 France. This locomotive was the same type as the first high speed, powerful electric locomotive that proved capable of replacing the steam locomotive on the main lines. Designed by Brown Boveri Company and Swiss Locomotive Works at um, Winterthur and built in France. Later classes of the 2D2 traveled in southwest France at the head of fast heavy trains moving at 87 miles per hour. So um, then I've got the meter gauge rail cars, and that's just a really cool picture. 
um, meter gauge rail cars with their two tone horns echoing across fields and valleys saved the rural and mountain railways at a time when the railroad was on the decline. Thanks to these modest vehicles, some rail networks, such as the one in the province region of France, have survived through the 1990s and will continue to provide useful services into the future. See? Mm, There's a recent photograph here. Get some coffee. Um, the 141 TD. Um, the 141 TD is typical of what worldwide railways ran at the head or rear suburban trains starting in the 1920s. Capable of operating in either direction at the same speed, this locomotive carried its own reserves of coal and water, which is why it was called a tank locomotive. Its North American classification is 282T. And it's France still? Got a lot of French cards. Bugatti real car. Look at that crazy thing. <clears throat> 1933. This real car bears the signature of one of the greatest inventors in the world of racing cars, Ettore Bugatti. During the 1930s, Bugatti was born in Italy, predicted the future of high speed trains, so it's not surprising that the rail car be proposed to the French rail networks was more or less the TVG of its time and had the same success. And there's a picture. This is the um, Ch Chapelon Pacific 462. Um, one of the world's most famous class of locomotives was the French 31171 to 31198 and the 3. 1111 to 31130 Pacific Series, noted not only for their splendid chocolate cover, color and yellow crosshatching, but also for their performance. These locomotives traveled at more than 81 miles per hour at the head of trains, such as the Paris Calais Flèche d'Or. And look at that. Let's take a look at that chocolate color train. That's really cool. This is the CC 65000. Um, these unusual-looking French diesel locomotives reached their hour of glory at the end of the 1950s on the Atlantic Coast Lines. They introduced reliable diesel traction and offered an alternative to steam traction on French non-electrified lines. So, very interesting stuff here. This is the BB9200. Um, succeeding a series of heavy, complex machines weighing up to 154 tons and mounted on 8 or even 12 axles, this electric locomotive weighed only 90 tons and only 4 axles. Nevertheless, it was more powerful and infinitely faster than its predecessors. It opened a new era for France, that of the BB locomotive. Now we're going to get to the golden age of the German system. Warning signals. So, this is um, 1878. The round yellow warning signal called a Schiebe or disc is well known throughout Germany, but it was preceded by many types of dislike signals that, starting in the 1870s, filled the very important role of war signal or warning signal on the German railroads. That might be a uh, war signal. I think in German they may be pronounced that war signal. This is the Trams of Freiburg. That looks pretty recent. Nineteen oh one. Located on the right bank of the Rhine, the city of Freiburg sits on the foot of the mountains of the Black Forest. Since the turn of the century, the city in West Germany has been served by a small but interesting network of trams and what is now called light rail. We me and Mary drove through Freiburg. Um and what I recall my biggest memory of Freiburg was there were bicycles everywhere. I've never seen so many bicycles in my whole life. 
just I think we were by a school or something and there were so many bicycles and I've been to all over the Netherlands and I've never seen so many bicycles until I went to Freiburg um, the Kriegslock 210 um, unusual in many ways this locomotive was born because of the German World War II effort Germany could not turn to standard design methods due to its urgent wartime needs with about 6,400 locomotives built over a short time, this series remains the most numerous for same type locomotives. So let's look at that again. 1942. This is the VT601 Trans Europe Express. 1957. The veritable prototype of the railroad solution for rapid service of European capitals in the 1950s and 60s, the German railroad's VT-601 train marked the will to fight against aviation competition and to preserve a clientele of businessmen demanding punctuality, speed, and comfort. Now we get to the Swiss system and the big Alpine electrics. The St. Gothard Crocodile. Look at that monster. Without a doubt, the most impressive of the European electric locomotives, the Crocodile was one of the most powerful of its time. This magnificent engine was intended for freight service on the steep slope at St. Gothard, which must be crossed in connecting the most important rail lines in Europe. This is the Flesh Rouge, which means red. And look at this sort of similarity. Just um, these rail cars used from the 1930s to the 1970s in Switzerland are known all over the world, known as the Flesh Rouge or Red Arrow. Um, these were the first lightweight electric power rail cars to be built for Switzerland, and they were designed to upgrade the equipment on secondary lines to a level equal to that of the main lines. Their rounded lines and cowed noses gave them an appearance that is unique to this day. Now we're in the other European systems. And that's a really pretty picture. Um, the Peloponnesus Railway. The Peloponnesus, uh, um, this has got to be Greece because when I was there, um, the when we were, um, we went all around, um, we were in Athens and Nafplio and in between, and we saw where they, there was a big long, like, um, dug ca canal that was dug and there was a, a bridge that went over it. And I think that was the break between the Peloponnese region and other region of Greece. And um, it was really interesting. Um, the, Pelopon the Peloponnesos Railway, uh, the southernmost region of Greece, has a vast railroad network that is almost totally with narrow gauge. Developed late, starting 1884, the system now extends more than 554, 454 miles is currently operated completely with diesel traction and has seen special operations from time to time using steam locomotives. Um, the Class 1 Pacific 462. Um, this is from Belgium, a country I've really enjoyed being to. Um, functional power, balanced lines, and partial streamlining characterize the Belgian Pacifics from the 1930s. They were, without a doubt, one of the most modern European locomotives of their time, and they marked a peak of steam traction in Belgium. The County Donegal Railway Railbus. This has got to be Ireland. 1931 Ireland. You might call it the English bus with its half cab on the side of the engine, but it's really an Irish rail bus. This economical diesel-powered vehicle, designed like a bus and simply adapted to rails, entered regular passenger service in Northwest Ireland and prolonged the life of County Donegal Railway for years. And then, if you continue through the book, you get other categories like the Grand Era, the peak of railroading in North America, 
And I have quite a few cards for that one. Real Rates of Distant Lands. I just have a few. But they're very interesting. Outstanding Records and Systems. Let's see. And... Light rail, metros, and subways. Modern trains and high-speed trains. As you can see, if you if you had continued to collect these cards, you would have had lots and lots and lots of cards in this binder. I don't even have any of the Italian ones. But um, these um, mail-order subscriptions were a big deal back in the day. But it's still neat to look at. As it could have only about halfway done collecting them either way i hope you enjoyed the video and maybe learned a little bit about trains and um and if you like my channel please subscribe um leave a comment a thumbs up click the bell icon uh all of that helps my channel greatly so thank you so much and until next time bye